With the injury to Denver Broncos cornerback Michael Ojemudia, who are some veteran free agent options that the Broncos could take a look at to solidify depth behind Ronald Darby and Patrick Sertan? Plus, we take a look at Broncos risers and followers after week two of the NFL preseason. You get that and much more on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome into a brand new episode, Locked On Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. Yay, thank you so much to everybody in Broncos country for tuning in, making Lockdown Broncos their first listen of the day. Whether you listen on your favorite audio podcasting platform or whether you watch on YouTube, do us a favor, hit that subscribe or that follow button so you never miss out on a day's worth of Denver Broncos news, content, coverage, and more every single day, all year long, from the South Stands to the end zone. I'm your host, as always, Cody Rourke, Broncos beat reporter for Mile High Sports, joined alongside by my co-host, Sarah Benger, site expert, predominantly orange.com. Sarah, you know what? I think that getting that Buffalo Bills loss out of the way the last day and a half, I think, is some good clarity. Had a chance to go back and watch the game. It's never as bad as the first time, like when you watch it, and it's never as great as you think it is when watching it. Something that Nathaniel Hackett tends to live by here. Uh, the Broncos, though, will have to make some moves this week. Roster cuts go from 85 to 80 by 2 o'clock p.m. Mountain Time on Tuesday. We'll see what the Broncos decide to do, but they may have to make a move in terms of looking at the cornerback market to maybe bring somebody in with Michael Ojemudia's injury he sustained in that loss. They they certainly might. And, and Cody, I mean, you're talking about re-watching the game. Are, you, are we sure it happened? Or are we sure the Broncos showed up for this game? Did it actually go down? No. Uh, unfortunately, obviously, a lot of negatives to take away. And, and the worst thing that can happen to a team during the preseason or training camp or anything that doesn't affect your standings or any game in general is injuries, right? You never want to see guys go down with injuries, but it can provide opportunities for you to kind of look, you know, reevaluate your roster and kind of see. So there's some problems names out there i think it's kind of surprising on at, at a lot of different positions actually there's kind of a lot of big name free agents available and at the cornerback position there's there's a couple guys that really stand out to me we have a list of five guys here that you put together cody starting with uh, one of these guys here jimmy smith a former colorado football player who played for the Baltimore Ravens for a handful of years there and was really good for them for a long time. And he's, he's available. He's out there. And I know he's older, but at the same time, this is free agency. We're talking about in August here. So these are the free agents that are available in August. A, a guy that is on this list. That's very intriguing to me that I've kind of thought maybe at some point in time, if the Broncos wanted to add a veteran to this roster, Xavier Rhodes, a former first round draft pick of the Vikings. So general manager George Payton is going to be very familiar with him and somebody that played very, very well for the Vikings for that stretch of time. There were there were some people that thought, I mean, maybe this guy's the best corner in the NFL. And then he's played pretty well for the Colts the last couple of years. So some intriguing names kind of at the top of that list for sure. Veteran guys that could come in and help. I think that that's probably the best option right now. And that's not saying that the Broncos rookies aren't capable. I, I think what Damari Mathis has shown this entire offseason throughout training camp and the preseason, I, I think he can step up if the Broncos need him to. But, you know, what if another guy goes down? You really do need a solidified option. And, you know, unfortunately for Michael Ojemudia, he didn't have the best of days uh, against the Buffalo Bills. And unfortunately, it resulted in him also getting injured, which now has him on the shelf for the second consecutive preseason in a row going into the regular season. It's just a string of bad luck for Ojemudi, who a guy like, like I said, I'm a big Michael Ojemudi fan. I think he's got some traits to him that can really translate well, but it's just about piecing all that together. I do know that the coaching staff does, does have patience with OJ though in this process. They believe that they can continue to develop him and Hey, if cornerback doesn't necessarily work out, they could try him at some other positions if need be, but he's also going to be a key special teams guy. But then there's also the thought that could a former Denver Bronco who's currently on the shelf right now, could he maybe come back and wear the orange and blue? Some people have thrown out the name of Chris Harris Jr. But at this point, I don't think that's as feasible right now, Sarah, because of the fact that he would primarily play inside the nickel. That's where they have K1 Williams. That's where they have Caden Stearns and PJ Locke as other guys that can play there. Not to mention Fayon uh, Hicks could be another one of those options there. I don't know if Chris Harris Jr., 
would be willing to come back to this Denver Broncos team and not be a leader on the defense, right? That That's now Justin Simmons, Kareem Jackson's role. Chris Harris Jr. had that opportunity, but he went to the Los Angeles Chargers in free agency that one time. So now he's kind of available right now and haven't really had it heard anything on him maybe getting the itch to come back to play football. We'll have to see how things go. But to me, there's some other names like Jack Rabbit, Janoris Jenkins, man. You know, like I said, he's been around the NFL for quite some time, not on a team right now. I, I'm not quite sure if he'd necessarily be the fit the Broncos are looking for, but there is one guy, sir, that in my opinion, I feel like would be a great veteran addition in a, in a role that is not meant to start for the Broncos at this point in his career. And that's Joe Hayden, who it'd be really cool to kind of see that circle back because the Broncos played the Steelers this year, maybe play against his former team, but more so, you know, against KJ Hamler. Last time we saw these two here, he got pushed over and he's like, damn, because he works out, remember? So KJ Hamler and Joe Hayden obviously have a nice little history together. But uh, outside of that, Sarah, I I feel like for me personally, and just taking a look at these five names, and I want to know your opinion, Jimmy Smith, Xavier Rhodes, and Joe Hayden honestly seem like the most logical team fits. I don't necessarily know about Chris Harris Jr. or Janoris Jenkins. Yeah, and I think just looking at this list, I was going to say Joe Hayden is the name that stands out the most to me as well. And one thing to be looking for here is could Russell Wilson start to flex those recruiting muscles, you know, to see who might need to come in. And because I think that whoever does come in, you're exactly right with what you said about Chris Harris Jr. And I think that could apply to all these guys. Who are you going to convince to come in? Because you're not replacing a starter on the defense. You would be kind of being that that guy who's, okay, you're the first man up if Ronald Darby or Patrick Sertan gets injured that we're going to put on the outside. That's kind of the role that they're taking. So, hey, money talks, and, and Russell Wilson could be convincing, I'm sure, uh, and George Payton as well. I mean, he he's very he's a very good general manager, and I think he knows how to talk to these veteran players to get them you know, on board with the vision and, and the role that they could have. So that's where I think a player like Joe Hayden, you're not saying come in and be our our cornerback two alongside Patrick Sertan. You're not even saying, hey, let's have you come in and be the, the third corner, the nickel. You're, you're having him come in and say, we want you to be the first guy off the sideline when we need somebody, even though Darby and Sertan are going to play the majority of snaps. I think that's a tough sell to veterans, but at the same time, again, money talks. You got a good recruiter in Russ. You got a great general manager in George Payton. And having the, the, the Broncos are in a different position now than they were a year ago at this time. A year ago at this time, I don't think you could could convince a veteran guy to come in because you're not necessarily a championship contender. Now you kind of have that label with you. So now you're going to be able to convince these guys that Hey, just an injury is probably going to happen at some point. Unfortunately, that's the reality of things. You're probably going to get a chance to play and play for a championship contending team. So that's enticing, I think. And I think you could get one of these guys. And I do think the Broncos need to do that with where they're at right now. Well, if I was a veteran cornerback who needed to be picked up, you know, Sarah, you had me sold. You had me sold. They're like, you know, it ain't about the money. You're like, if I have a chance to win a Super Bowl ring, I'm going to take it because you do have a, a really good offense, really good quarterback, and a really good nucleus on defense. It's a great fit for, I think, a veteran guy who's currently not on any other NFL team right now. I think that's the most important thing. So we'll see if the Broncos get busy, if they look at waivers this week at the cornerback position. But a veteran option should be on the Broncos' minds this week. And Broncos country coming up here in just a moment. Sarah and I, we're going to talk about some risers from the Broncos' loss against the Buffalo Bills on Saturday, including an undrafted rookie free agent who we are pounding the table for. We'll talk about that coming up here in just a moment. But before we do that, let me tell you about BetOnline.net, the sponsor of today's episode, Lockdown Broncos. BetOnline.net is the fastest and the easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. You can find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games you can find reviews and news of every league including major league baseball nfl nba nhl combat sports esports and even golf bet online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in-game betting scores and podcasts they have you covered so head to bet online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today bet online where the game starts Despite the Broncos' loss on Saturday to the Buffalo Bills, there were several players who rose up in our perception ahead of the final week of the NFL preseason. Thank you so much, Broncos country, for tuning in to Lockdown Broncos, making us your first listen of the day every single day. Good for your morning cup of coffee, your morning walk, your morning run, your drive to work in the morning, or if you're having breakfast, Lockdown Broncos, we are certainly here for you. Hit that subscribe to that follow button so you never miss out on a day's worth of Denver Broncos news, content coverage, and more. Sarah, let's take a look at some risers and followers. We'll get to the followers a little bit later on here in the show, but I I feel like we should definitely start things off with taking a look at some risers here. 
And first off, I really want to highlight an undrafted rookie free agent who, in my opinion, just watching him in practice, watching him in the first couple games of the preseason, I want to pound the table for this guy to make the active roster. And he would be one of two undrafted rookie free agents to make the roster at this position. And if it were up to me, it would be Jalen Virgil at wide receiver. Now, I think going back to his game against the Bills, he only had two catches in this game. But, Sarah, he had this one catch where he had to twist around, contort his body, and he just had massively good focus, catching the ball, hauling it in, moving the chains for a first down. And he's become a guy that one of the other guys we'll talk about later has become very, very fond of all throughout uh, the preseason and in training camp. But, Man, I, I just want to see more of Jalen Virgil. I think that if you were to release him, if Denver were to release him, he's not going to clear waivers. There will be a team out there that does claim it. If Max Borgie can get claimed by a team, Jalen Virgil is going with the quickness. It kind of reminds me, Cody, of when the Broncos tried to sneak Shaquille Barrett through waivers back in the day. And I was just, I think I lost sleep that night over the idea that some team was definitely going mean, to, he had one of the best preseasons I've ever seen. I can't believe still to this day, I can't believe that nobody claimed him off waivers. The Broncos snuck him onto the practice squad, but there there's to play devil's advocate a little bit. Yeah. I mean, a lot of teams have a guy like Jalen Virgil, maybe on their roster that they're like, Oh yeah, we love this guy. We, we probably won't be able to sneak him through waivers, but we're going to try. And I think a lot of teams think that way. And a lot of teams get burned that way. So uh, to me, if I'm the Denver Broncos, if I'm George Payton, I'm not putting Jalen Virgil through waivers at this point. And I think that there's a couple of primary reasons for that. Number one, the dude has balled out in the preseason and at training camp, he's made quite a few plays as well. So what kind of message are you sending to players who are undrafted that are coming in when you have your next undrafted class and, and somebody comes in and has a huge preseason like Jalen Virgil has and puts together the tape and does things on special teams and on offense to prove that they can contribute in every phase they do all these things and then they don't make the roster. Like what message does that send to these other guys that are coming in trying to make your team that, okay, well, if I do everything right, I guess my best, my best opportunity is to impress another team. So I think for me, Jalen Virgil as well, Cody, a big riser from this game and somebody who, I mean, maybe we'll see him, you know, catching passes from a different starting quarterback this week. We'll kind of see in terms of what the Broncos do to play it that way. We'll have another episode on that. I'm sure. But I think another riser from this game, in my opinion, was the guy that was under center throwing the ball to Jalen Virgil in that second half against the Bills. Hashtag let it rip. Brett Rippon is our second riser from the Broncos game against the Buffalo Bills. Obviously 21 of 26 passing, very efficient, 191 yards and a touchdown to Eric Sauber. But I'd say for me, what was the most impressive about Brett Rippon, regardless of who the Buffalo Bills are playing, Buffalo is a very loaded team. Like their depth is unbelievably good. And that's why I think they're the favorite for the Super Bowl this year in the eyes of many national media members. And including here at the Lockdown Podcast Network, a lot of us you know, have the belief that, hey, Buffalo is probably the, the strongest team right now, perception wise, coming into this year. Uh, so they're going to be, a, they were a tough team for Denver. But Brett Rip and the way he just came in, the offense could not move the ball, sir. Like at halftime, the Broncos only had 92 total yards of offense. Now, after that very promising first drive that Josh Johnson led, the Bills defense adjusted that second drive, five plays. Minus two yards of offense, a couple of penalties, obviously, were some bailout factors there, but it just seemed like there wasn't as much rhythm and flow. But granted, how would have Brett Rippon done if he was in Josh Johnson's shoes in that situation, taking on that first and second team Bills defense rather than taking on the second and third team that he did? I still think it warrants enough that he should probably get some consideration to start this week because his knowledge and just his ball placement, I think you need to reward players like that for how he played just playing fearless too like that was the one thing like he's not afraid to throw the ball deep and what was one of the biggest criticisms that people had of Brett Rippon well he doesn't really have a really big arm so he's not going to necessarily take shots downfield he's taken several shots downfield this preseason and in training camp he's got a little bit more confidence to him I really like what I saw from Brett Rippon and some other players were on the beneficiary side of what he was doing not just Jalen Virgil but at a position that you and I both said we need to see a little bit more out of coming into the second week of the preseason. Yeah, we said we wanted to see more from the tight ends, and I think uh, somebody heard us, or maybe they were all thinking the same thing, right? We saw the nice touchdown to Eric Saubert in this game, so he's a guy that I think maybe deserves a little riser status, and that wasn't the only pass that he caught either. So he showed some nice things in the game as a receiver, as did Alberto Kuebuna, right? And and I think everybody's very surprised to be seeing how long Alberto is playing into these games, but 
I mean, he was a backup last year or a tight end two last year. And, and really, he didn't play much as a rookie. So he kind of needs reps. I get that, you know, there's the distinction between, well, he's a guy that's going to be contributing heavily to the offense and this and that. But it's nice to see him go out there and make plays. I, I think that definitely he needs to be able to show that he can go out there and catch those deep balls. And it took him a little bobbling to get the ball in. But he showed his ability to be a vertical threat in the passing game. He showed his ability to be a big play guy at the tight end position. And you love to see that. You love to see the catch by Eric Saubert in the back of the end zone. Just looking super athletic back there. I mean, I know he was pretty open. But he he made a good adjustment on that ball in the air and kind of showed just some some of his catch radius, really. So I like what these two guys showed in this game. I think we were really needing to see some more involvement from the tight ends and just what they could do. And the Broncos did kind of try to force feed a little bit to Albert O. They had some of those quick hitting passing plays to him that one of them was for a decent five yard chunk. The other one, I think the the Bills kind of figured it out and got him for a no no gain or something like that so there was some give and take I think there but ultimately the tight ends were risers in my opinion well and the thing with Albert O2 the thing that stood out to me and, and I was glad that we saw this just the vertical element right going downfield and what was one of the things that we talked about kind of those concentration drops that he struggled with through the first couple of years of his career in the NFL on the vertical routes is just being able to hold the ball in like he hauled in some tough tough catches including that 27 yarder so that was a positive step in the right direction for Albert O and we'll see if Greg Dulcich gets a little bit more acclimated back into things here at practice this week he did return to practice last week wearing his gear but then went off and did some work on the side field so a promising step in the right direction but the Broncos do not want to run into any more setbacks so they're not going to ramp things up with them until they're fully ready and cleared by the medical staff to do just that but Broncos country coming up here in just a moment we're going to talk about some players who dropped a little bit including a newcomer who a lot of fans in Broncos country had some high expectations for we get to that coming up here in just a moment but let me tell you about a very important message you're hanging out with some friends and putting back a few drinks a few becomes a few too many and as the evening comes to an end people start to head out you think you're calling for a ride Nah, you live nearby and you can make it home okay. It's no big deal. What are the odds you'll get pulled over anyway? And even so, what's the worst that could happen? Your insurance goes up, you lose your license, you lose your job, you total your car, you kill someone. Everyone knows about the risks of driving drunk and the results are tragic and often deadly. However, that still doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our roads to save lives. So if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, Think again, play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. And it only takes one mistake to change your life and to change somebody else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. As we approach the fourth quarter action on today's episode, Lockdown Broncos, we'll focus on some of the fallers from the Broncos' loss to the Buffalo Bills in Saturday's action ahead of roster cuts, which is looming around 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. That's 2 p.m. Mountain time on Tuesday. We'll have covered here, Lockdown Broncos, from the 85 to 80 roster cuts here. Thank you so much, Broncos country. Tuning in, make it Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day. All right, Sarah. This is kind of an important segment, right? When we talk about risers, it's always great to highlight guys who are kind of performing at a really good level that are rising up the charts a little bit, rising up in perception by everybody in Broncos country. And then there's ones where there's the fallers, right, where they didn't either do enough or they didn't do anything in the eyes of Broncos country to really warrant consideration, especially as roster cuts do approach. And let's start off with the Broncos punting situation here. Sam Martin. Now, he suffered an injury in pregame, an ankle injury. We'll find out more from Broncos head coach Nathaniel Hackett this week at practice. But he's locked into a uh, punter competition with Corliss Waitman, who averaged 52 yards per punt in Saturday's loss against the Buffalo Bills, including a 63-yard booming punt. Uh, that was very impressive there. He's always had the most consistent high-hanging punt so far in, in training camp and in preseason so far, so something to keep an eye on. But he falls simply because of the fact that this injury comes at a very inopportune time and that he couldn't play. Now, granted, the injury was beyond his control. So this is one of those unfair things that you unfortunately factor into whether or not you keep a guy on your roster. It does. And I think injury adds to that. And the fact that Corliss Wayman went out there and did a pretty good job as well. So it's certainly one of those things where you hate to see the timing of all this. You hate to see anybody get injured whatsoever. But for Sam Martin, if you're in a competition, this is tough. I mean, this is tough timing for, for this whole deal because the Broncos, they I would guess that they've been pretty impressed by Corliss Waitman. I don't know enough about the intricacies of being a punter in the NFL and, and these different things, but if, if it passes the eye test to me, I feel like Corliss Waitman has done a pretty 
pretty good job out there. So to me, that's that's your indicator right there. If Sam Martin is out for any extended period of time, that could end up being costly for him in this whole punting competition. And, and speaking of competition, the, the inside linebacker spot, Cody, we got a, we got an opportunity to see the guys that the Broncos have after Jonas Griffith out there, along with the newest addition, Joe Schobert. And I feel like, to me, Joe Schobert was one of the biggest fallers from this game, no doubt. I mean, he's out there with the second and third units and not even really a lot with the second unit. He was mostly out there with the third group. And to me, he just looked, uh, and I got to give him a little bit of grace here, right? I mean, he was out there in a scheme that he's never been in. He's basically been on the job for a week. So to give him a little bit of credit for that, but at the same time, man, I just, I expected so much more out of him. I expected him to be blowing up blockers. I expected him to be out there attacking those gaps and creating TFLs, especially against second and third team players on the Buffalo Bills side. That was really disappointing to me. And I think you and I have talked about this. It, it just begs the question of, will he end up making this final roster at all? I, I mean, I don't know. I think definitely if he has another performance like we saw against the Bills, I don't think you keep him around. So to me, Joe Schobert is a big follower from this game. Well, and I think a lot of people had high expectations because he's a former pro bowler. I mean, he's a guy that has had consistent 100 plus tackles almost every single season that he's been in the National Football League. So the fact that was kind of surprising to me is all throughout the week, you know, his first day in Denver, they throw him into the fire alongside Josie Jewell a little bit. He gets some first team reps, so I think it's just to get up to speed on the playbook and things like that. But then for the rest of the week, I mean, he's, he's getting reps with the third team defense, not even the second team. Like it's guys like Alex Singleton, Justin Sternod, they're getting reps with Josie Jewell more so than Joe Schobert, which I think was a very telling sign. Now, granted, Schobert is just kind of fresh off the couch a little bit. You know, he says he's been training in Denver. Obviously, he and his wife had just recently moved to the area. But yeah, you definitely expected more. And, and the areas of his game where he struggled was attacking downhill and getting sealed off by a lineman, not necessarily getting it, being able to get off a block, I think was one thing, but also just missed tackles. And it, th that doesn't just apply to Joe Schober. Like Alex Singleton had a couple of missed tackles in this game. Barrington Wade had several missed tackles in this game. The Broncos defensive line and the linebackers, this was not their prettiest game. So, you know, Joe Schober, I think the expectations were a little bit higher, which is why he's going to fall a little bit here in our faller list here. But the next guy here, and this can really apply to the defensive line as well, going back and rewatching, Buffalo just blew them off the line of scrimmage with ease. And one guy that I felt like has just kind of dropped a little bit this offseason, it's been Matelvin Aguim. Matelvin Aguim, I, I haven't seen everything that we saw from him in training camp last year or in the preseason last year. We'll see what the Broncos decide to do, but man, it was just not a very good performance by the Broncos front seven and something that these guys, and, and I'll be eager, and I'll ask Nathaniel Hackett this this week, is how how have the young guys responded in the locker room? Like, you know, what what was their your message to them? Because for a lot of them, like, they've never experienced this type of result in the National Football League. What was this like for the the mentality of the locker room for the young guys, and how, how can you get it to where they don't dwell on this? To me, I think that's going to be a very important storyline to follow all throughout this week here as the Denver Broncos prepare to wrap up the preseason this upcoming Saturday against the Minnesota Vikings, 7 o'clock p.m. Mountain Time kickoff in Power Field at Mile High. I'll be there at the game, and I'll have to drive over. You'll get another late episode courtesy of Sarah Bettinger and myself here at the Lockdown Broncos podcast. But make sure you tune your dials or you watch us every single day right here in the lead-up to the Minnesota Vikings game so you never miss out on the daily objective Denver Broncos news content coverage that you in Broncos country do. Deserve. No hot takes, none of that BS. You get it all straight and objective here. Lockdown Broncos.